Chapter Two of Literary Taste: How to Form It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Literary Taste: How to Form It, by Arnold Bennett. Chapter Two. Your particular case. The attitude of the average decent person toward the classics of his own tongue is one of distrust. I had almost said of fear. I will not take the case of Shakespeare, for Shakespeare is taught in schools. That is to say, the Board of Education and all authorities pedagogic bind themselves together in a determined effort to make every boy in the land a lifelong enemy of Shakespeare. It's a mercy they don't teach Blake. I will take, for an example, Sir Thomas Brown, as to whom the average person has no offensive juvenile memories. He is bound to have read somewhere that the style of Sir Thomas Brown is unsurpassed by anything in English literature. One day he sees the Religio Medici in a shop window, or rather outside a shop window, for he would hesitate about entering a bookshop. And he buys it, by way of a mild experiment. He does not expect to be enchanted by it. A profound instinct tells him that Sir Thomas Brown is not in his line, and in the result he is even less enchanted than he expected to be. He reads the introduction, and he glances at the first page or two of the work. He sees nothing but words. The work makes no appeal to him whatever. He is surrounded by trees, and cannot perceive the forest. He puts the book away. If Sir Thomas Brown is mentioned, he will say, Yes, very fine, with a feeling of pride that he has, at any rate, bought and inspected Sir Thomas Brown. Deep in his heart, is a suspicion that the people who get enthusiastic about Sir Thomas Brown are vain and conceited posers. After a year or so, when he has recovered from the discouragement caused by Sir Thomas Brown, he may, if he is young and hopeful, repeat the experiment with Congreve or Addison. Same sequel, and so on perhaps for a decade, until his commerce with the classics finally expires. That, magazines and newish fiction apart, is the literary history of the average, decent person. And even your case, though you are genuinely preoccupied with thoughts of literature, bears certain disturbing resemblances to the drab case of the average person. You do not approach the classics with gusto, anyhow not with the same gusto as you would approach a new novel by a modern author who had taken your fancy. You never murmured to yourself when reading Gibbon's Decline and Fall in Bed, Well, I really must read one more chapter before I go to sleep. Speaking generally, the classics do not afford you a pleasure commensurate with their renown. You peruse them with a sense of duty, a sense of doing the right thing, a sense of improving yourself, rather than a sense of gladness. You do not smack your lips. You say, This is good for me. You make little plans for reading, and then you invent excuses for breaking the plans. Something new, something which is not a classic, will surely draw you away from a classic. It is all very well for you to pretend to agree with the verdict of the elect that Clarissa Harlow is one of the greatest novels in the world. A new Kipling, or even a new number of a magazine, will cause you to neglect Clarissa Harlow, just as though Kipling, etc., could not be kept for a few days without turning sour so that you have to ordain rules for yourself, as I will not read anything else until I have read Richardson or Gibbon for an hour each day, thus proving that you regard a classic as a pill, the swallowing of which merits jam. And the more modern a classic is, the more it resembles the stuff of the year, and the less it resembles the classics of the centuries, the more easy and enticing do you find that classic. Hence you are glad that George Eliot, the Brontes, Thackeray, are considered as classics, because you really do enjoy them. Your sentiments concerning them approach your sentiments concerning a rattling good story in a magazine. I may have exaggerated, or, on the other hand, I may have understated the unsatisfactory characteristics of your particular case, but it is probable that in the mirror I hold up to you, you recognize the rough outlines of your likeness. You do not care to admit it, but it is so. You are not content with yourself. The desire to be more truly literary persists in you. 
you feel that there is something wrong in you but you cannot put your finger on the spot further you feel that you're a bit of a sham something within you continually forces you to exhibit for the classics an enthusiasm which you do not sincerely feel you even try to persuade yourself that you are enjoying a book when the next moment you drop it in the middle and forget to resume it you occasionally buy classical works and do not read them at all you practically decide that it is enough to possess them and that the mere possession of them gives you a cachet the truth is you are a sham and your soul is a sea of uneasy remorse you reflect according to what matthew arnold says i ought to be perfectly mad about wordsworth's prelude and i am not why am i not have i got to be learned to undertake a vast course of study in order to be perfectly mad about wordsworth's prelude or am i born without the faculty of pure taste in literature despite my vague longings i do wish i could smack my lips over wordsworth's prelude as i did over that splendid story by h g wells the country of the blind in the strand magazine yes i am convinced that in your dissatisfied your diviner moments you address yourself in these terms i am convinced that i have diagnosed your symptoms now the enterprise of forming one's literary taste is an agreeable one if it is not agreeable it cannot succeed but this does not imply that it is an easy or a brief one the enterprise of beating Colonel Bogeyed Golf is an agreeable one, but it means honest and regular work, a fact to be borne in mind always. You are certainly not going to realize your ambition, and so great, so influential an ambition, by spasmodic and half-hearted effort. You must begin by making up your mind adequately. You must rise to the height of the affair. You must approach a grand undertaking in a grand manner you ought to mark the day in your calendar as a solemnity human nature is weak and has need of tricky aids even in the pursuit of happiness time will be necessary to you and time regularly and sacredly set apart many people affirm that they cannot be regular that regularity numbs them i think this is true of very few people and that in the rest the objection to regularity is merely an attempt to excuse idleness i am inclined to think that you personally are capable of regularity and i am sure that if you firmly and constantly devote certain specific hours on certain specific days of the week to this business of forming your literary taste you will arrive at the goal much sooner the simple act of resolution will help you this is the first preliminary the second preliminary is to surround yourself with books to create for yourself a bookish atmosphere the merely physical side of books is important more important than it may seem to the inexperienced theoretically save for works of reference a student has need for but one book at a time theoretically an amateur of literature might develop his taste by expending sixpence a week or a penny a day in one sixpenny edition of a classic after another sixpenny edition of a classic and he might store his library in a hat-box or a biscuit tin but in practice he would have to be a monster of resolution to succeed in such conditions the eye must be flattered the hand must be flattered the sense of owning must be flattered sacrifices must be made for the acquisition of literature that which has cost a sacrifice is always endeared a detailed scheme of buying books will come later in the light of further knowledge for the present buy buy whatever has received the imprimatur of critical authority buy without any immediate reference to what you will read buy surround yourself with volumes as handsome as you can afford and for reading all that i will now particularly enjoin is a general and inclusive tasting in order to attain a sort of familiarity with the look of literature in all its branches a turning over of the pages of a volume of chambers cyclopedia of english literature the third for preference may be suggested as an admirable and diverting exercise you might mark the authors that flash an appeal to you end of chapter two